Hello, my name's Ruby. I'm a co-founder of Eco Resolution and super excited to be speaking with Dr. Jel Jelka Borsten today as part of Eco Resolution's exploration of women and feminism in relation to the climate crisis and environmental destruction. So Jelka is a reader at, in gender and diversity at King's College London, where she researches on violence against women and ramifications for policy in post-conflict societies and also works on issues regarding transformative gender justice. So thank you so much, Jelka, for joining us. How are you? I'm very well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, like we were really keen to speak with you because of the um, intersectional feminist approach you take to change and systemic change that sees violent systems of domination and subordination um, as being rooted in binaries of gender um, and then how that relates to race and class. Um, and violence towards land and the environment is clearly related to these hierarchies too. So we found it such a transformative lens to view activism and change making, as it implies that you can only address injustice by transforming all of the relations that underpin the possibility of like violence and injustice in the first place. Um, so it's much less like quick fix and totally transformational. So um, I'd love um, with you just over the next um, amount of time to discuss um, how the environmental crisis is gendered and how um, it's affected by the binaries that permeate our society and then what that could mean when, if we want to really transform the systems and hierarchies that deepen it. So, um, yeah, Thanks. I thought maybe if you could just tell us what exactly is intersectional feminism and why is agenda okay. analysis so important? Okay, so uh, these are really complex questions and there's not, it, it, there's no, not one straightforward answer, of course, so that as sort of an overall caveat to the discussion. Um, but I think that to start with, it's really important to highlight what we mean by gender in the first place and by gender binary in the first place. So I think that analytically, um, sort of using a gender lens and using a feminist lens is really about um, looking at power relations and how power is structured in society. And this is immediately where the intersectionality comes in because um, if we're talking about the hierarchies in society and how power is structured, political power, social power, economic power, from, uh, from at the top, at the, the, the uh, major global institutions or national institutions to local community and household power relations, then this is, then inequalities are very often uh, structured along um, uh, categories of gender. No, it's about uh, the male and the female. It's about um, what is perceived as as uh, um, as uh, 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 gender roles. What are masculine gender roles? What is fe femininity? How is one supposed to be acting? What is um, acceptable to how labor is structured? Reproductive labor, productive labor. Who has responsibility over the land, for example? Who works the land? Who has responsibility in bringing um, money back home? Who has responsibility over caring for the household and the children, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Those are all power relations. The, the, how how work and economy and decision making is structured, and that very often is gendered which is why gender is such a useful lens to use in order to analyze uh, power relations. But it's not only gendered, and that's where intersectionality comes in, because power is in, in most societies has other uh, inequalities that intertwine with gender. And that is uh, most often we associate that with, with race. Um, but there are other um, categories of difference that are very often used to, um, um, to create a hierarchy between people and between roles. So disability is a very important category of differentiation. Um, 
sexuality is very important. You know? So against the, the, the binary, everybody who does not conform to the gender binary of male and female and what the associated roles are, are then um, 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 receive a different, are treated differently within that uh, constellation of, of power relations. So there are different, this is why intersectionality is so important that if we want to use gender in order to understand power relations in broader society, be that political, i.e. decision-making or economic, who does what and who gets what, uh, or social, who gets to speak at a um, um, at community level, um, uh, who does the caring work, etc., etc. then it's not only about gender, but very much also about other categories of differentiation in any given context, be that race, sexuality, disability, age can be uh, another important uh, category of differentiation. So it's really important to understand these intersecting inequalities, um, and particularly because you know, a, a person's position in those hierarchies is very often not only determined by one's gender, but by, by any of those other categories, creating a completely different um, uh, subject position in the hierarchies of any given context. Mm. So it's a continual um, negotiation of subordination and, and domination, or what's on top and what's, and what's beneath. Um, then when that comes to oppression, um, how does that relate to gender? And, and, and then are we understanding gender as, or these other forms of binaries as strong versus weak? Like what are the types of um, binaries that are imbued in gender roles? That, that you see. So it, it can be a whole range of things, of course, of what what is considered powerful. But in general, it is about a division of labor and a division of of decision making. No, um, and that might be around uh, what is uh, so that what is considered weak in any given society is then being subordinated to that what is considered strong, no? So we, we associate masculinity with strength and femininity with weakness. Uh, there are many arguments to to raise against that, but that is how socially we're, we're, um, uh, we have learned to understand masculinity and femininity. And that has an effect on everything we do, you know, and how, how, um, how we talk about masculinity and femininity and about uh, how society uh, functions. Mm. So it's kind of the social norms and stereotypes and roles that we live with. That and that then translates into all those stereotypes and roles that that we live with. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's this wonderful video of um, um, uh, how does a girl run or something. You have all these kind of kind of um, now uh, uh, of of ways and videos and and campaigns to highlight the silliness of a lot of those stereotypes, including the idea that girls run differently than boys, for example, which are just nonsense, but they're very common beliefs throughout society that uh, for whatever reason, um, girls and women are inherently different from men and hence are less capable than men in a majority of things, apart from the reproductive work, caring work. That's where they're better, but it's unskilled because it comes naturally and hence it's undervalued. So care work is undervalued in our society because it comes naturally mm. to women. That's the idea, no? even though there's no evidence whatsoever um, that um, uh, women are better at care work than men would be. No? Mm. So it's like but those are the stereotypes that we live with and that, that, that we continue to reproduce in the everyday. Mm. So then how would these um, paradigms of domination, subordination, or, or power and the powerless, um, the oppressed and the oppressor, how does that relate to, to violence and kind of systematic violence? So um, I think that uh, 
all violence is somehow a product of gendered stereotypes, you know? So not only the violence against women and girls is gendered, but violence between men is also gendered. It's about pe people trying to sort of espouse a particular uh, strength of themselves and dominate others. So it's about uh, power over, over others, you no, know, by violent means. Um, and that is very often or generally um, uh, um, related to ideas about masculinity and femininity, and very often has all kinds of connotations of race as well, you no, know, about who is um, patriarchal relations, you no, know, who is the boss over whom, and how do you reinforce that? Uh, that hierarchy between people, these, these relations of domination and subordination. And in everyday life, we see that violence against women is, is, is just very widespread in, in all our societies. There are no, uh, it's, uh, if that is Europe or Latin America or uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, violence against women is very high. I might defer a little bit uh, in the sense that you know, the numbers might be between 25% of all women experience violence uh, from their intimate partners in one area of the world and it's 50% or even 70% in other parts of the world. But even 25%, which is one of the lowest in the world, is very, very high, of course. That's one in four women experience uh, intimate partner violence in their lifetime, which is very high. So it's very common in our everyday life to be confronted with very violent or aggressive uh, ways of uh, reproducing these inequalities um, based on gender, in for, for first and foremost, that's what we're talking about. But at the same time, these often have all kinds of other connotations related to race, disability, sexuality very often. So these power relations and these violences um, very often are aimed at reproducing the particular powerful position of the person who um, uh, who exerts that violence upon others. Mm. Which I suppose we see massively in political in many political leaders who are using like asserting power and domination over others. Um, and like Trump particularly um, and like yeah. Bolsonaro. I wonder like how else you see these um, playing into politics and um, political leaders and why that yeah. would mean that they would be elected in the first place like why is Trump such a huge following why do we love to watch films of violence and warfare um, like why is Bolsonaro having such a popularity in Brazil like why, what do you think makes that so I think um, th so the, the political appeal of this kind of um, aggressive masculinity um, it lies a little bit in a fear of losing certain privileges, I believe. No, so Trump, Bolsonaro, um, Duterte in the Philippines and, and others elsewhere um, appeal to a particular part of the population that feels threatened by changes in society that suggest um, that there might be uh, power in being queer or being a woman or in being black or in being, uh, uh, or in being disabled, i.e. that other people might also have power and decision-making power, no? So I feel that these, um, these uh, violent masculinities in, uh, in the political arena now are really sort of pushing back to this increased diversity in contemporary society. So, I mean, it's to a certain extent, it's, an, it's a, a benign interpretation of what's going on. So instead of saying, oh, it's all miserable, I'm basically saying, well, it, we can see this as a, as a, as a reaction to what is largely a positive or a progressive development in societies, you know, which is every time more inclusive. And this is just a backlash, a, a backlash but we will come back to, to the, the other side with a more, um, um, 
with a, a political arena that is more supportive um, of diversity and that will make an effort to continue with the with the the, the political um, platform for more inclusion and diversity more generally. So I think that these um, uh, these very uh, aggressive racist misogynist political leaders appeal to that part of the population that has benefited from the uh, lack of diversity that has benefited from a patriarchal um, ordering of society in which they had unearned privilege you know so these leaders are basically saying uh, to that electorate, well, you better vote for me because if not, all the other scary people will come and and, and threaten your privilege. No, mm. um, and that is really difficult because it means that there is a, a a a part of society that does feel threatened. So political leaders do need to take that into account. No, what do you do with with that um, part of society that that feels threatened? Uh, because they feel that their privileges are being um, taken away from them. And to a certain extent, that's true. Yeah. And with reason, no, because it means that those privileges are then more widely shared mm -hmm. among um, um, uh, a larger group, a more inclusive group. So I suppose if that makes sense. Yeah, it's all linked to fear um, of losing what you've got. And yeah. um, kind of a desire and, and then those methodologies of kind of control and subordination of um, kind of like Trump for example saying he's going to build a wall against Mexico <laughs> or like kind of these 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 methods of to make people feel safe but it's actually a kind of a narrative of warfare and militarization that would that's kind of uns unsettled and is so ironic um, and if we see kind of political oppression as gendered and rooted in the same kind of binaries and hierarchies, like that would mean that all economic or political and social policy is also seen within the same lens as, as gendered or like it's, it's simply always trying to reinstate the same order. Um, I wonder if there's ever do you see examples globally of political systems that are transformative in how they approach policy making? Yeah, I do. I do. I don't. I mean, there's no system that is perfect, no. But you do see um, that particular countries or particular um, that there are attempts in 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 different countries to um, do politics differently and feed into policy differently. Uh, um, Sweden is, is the last couple of years very actively and vocally promoting a fe feminist foreign policy, for example, mm -hmm. which is really new and, and not only doing it, but speaking about it and, and, and advocating for it uh, is a big deal and, and might have transformative um uh results in the end and that doesn't mean that everything is perfect but that it, it is a, a change and if we look at um, um jacinda arden in in um, in new zealand again that is transformative politics it might not seem very transformative at the moment um but particularly in this context of, of very um, authoritarian misogynist racist politics that we see in such powerful countries such as the us and brazil then the very um uh, the, the politics of empathy that that uh, new zealand is currently um uh, uh, espousing is is really quite transformative, I think. Mm. So I do think yes, transformative politics is is possible, but it is it seems to be a little bit a two steps forward and a one step back kind of process at the moment. Um, but again, I I think that this is not it it it's not lasting. So let's hope that we're we're very soon in the two steps forward again. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a big cultural and big cultural shift I think it's um it's not just political because I think or, or or 
about kind of um, whether it's democracy or dictatorship feels a lot more complex than that because if the culture is rooted in gender violence uh, illiberal um, people will be elected into positions of power because it's the power that is idealized and venerated um, so it's kind of interesting to think about that exchange between the positions of power and the policymakers with the people who are voting for them or who are and that continual like dialogue and exchange between the two um, that can take it to another place absolutely but so in that sense i think that there there is um there's there's a clear polarization going on in politics more generally and not only in the us i think britain is a very good example of that polarization as well no uh, which was particularly uh, clear with the brexit vote and and how uh, the british public and politics has dealt with that over the last four years since the vote uh, is is extremely polarized no so it's it's uh, um um it feels very much as as a uh, as, as a part of society is willing to uh, to take those two steps forward much quicker and wants to really change those um, uh, the the values um, change them to to a more uh, equal society more inclusive society and another part that is afraid of those changes and wants to stay where it is or even take a step back no and i find it interesting that you see that for example in uh, uh, so uh, i mean the idea that there is um, while we are living in in clearly in a very conservative era let's say in which um, right wing politics uh, has gained so much ground at the same time companies universities schools are doing every time more in terms of diversity and equality for example and there are huge campaigns at university against sexual violence on campus for example no and we have the me too movement in uh, uh, in europe and the us and the Una menos movement in latin america and similar movements in india and, and south africa no so it and that is exactly what that polarization seems to um uh, seems to be, you know, between those who want to move forward and change and transform society uh, to be more equal, inclusive, and those who who do not, who who are afraid of that or who think or feel that their privileges are being taken away. Mm. And so, then, how does this link to anti-environmentalism? So, if you've got the fear of the unsettle of the social order, how? Because it's so ironic in a way. The climate crisis is coming. To maintain the social order, you're going to have to protect the environment. But the opposite is happening. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. Um, yeah. So I wonder what you think about that. Well, I think that, uh, again, uh, I think it, it fits the same logic of a polarization and of a more inclusive society and a, and a more respectful society. Um, and I think that sort of the, the exploitation and abuse of the environment of uh, through natural resource extraction, through pollution, um, through the lack of protecting our natural resources, comes very much from that same constellation of patriarchal capitalist power in which a very small group of largely men um, want to dominate the world, their world. And part of that is the environment because for the majority of the 20th century, the, the, the economic ideology has been that you, you conquer the environment, you conquer nature, you, you know, you're stronger than, the humanity is stronger than, than, than nature. We conquer that, we control it, we're, um, uh, we're the boss. No, that has been very much the, the, the masculine economic and political uh, perspective of how you deal with the environment. And that means that you need to be able to exploit it. No, you exploit them, you're, the, you're in control, you exploit the environment and, and uh, you're not gonna be, be, be kind and nice and wishy-washy. No, so it fits in this sort of, in this slightly distorted idea of masculinity, really. Um, that 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 sort of 
um, uh, tells uh, tells us that you know that that part of this masculine power is having um, the exploitative rights over uh, people, uh, women, uh, non-white people, um, migrants, uh, and nature. You know, even though it's very clear that in the meantime, even more control over nature's control over nature is being lost by exploiting it so much. Uh, but they're not ready to see that yet. So they prefer to go on and exploit the earth. You no, know? there's this wonderful paper by um, Daggett Petro, on petro masculinities. And I really mm -hmm. advise everyone to look that up uh, to Google petro masculinities, this idea of that there is power invested in, in sort of the, the idea of natural resource exploitation. Mm. So it's a continual reassertion of these hierarchies of privilege and like who has power to go and deforest indigenous lands and build an open mine there um, and Ab relocate those people to another space and demolish their culture and the community that there's, was alive there. Um, it's like the most ultimate extreme form of violence you could think of. But this is very widespread, and that's no, no. Uh, it's it's um, it's amazing how in large parts of the world, in I know Latin America best, but the same is happening in parts of of uh, Southern Africa and in parts of Asia, where international transnational companies with their money in London or in in Toronto or uh, or or in Washington, uh, how they just come in, take the lands of others who live there um, and uh, you know, kick them off their own land with, with money or not at all, or just with violence and start exploiting the land and taking away the resources. And in the meantime, they pollute the water. So the villages around those mining areas will then have polluted water and the people will get sick uh, it, through the pollution and the, the um, um, the destruction of land, agricultural resources uh, are destroyed. So these have tremendous effects, not only on the broader issue of climate change, mm. um, but on local communities, no? And these local communities don't have the political power in their own communities, no? So the Peruvian indigenous people do not have enough political clout to protest against their own government and the Peruvian government apparently does not have enough interest in those indigenous land to protect, to be on the side of those communities and prevent the international companies to come in. And why not? Because the Peruvian government needs the, 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 the taxes from those international governments in order to pay for its own redistributed um, uh, policies. No, so it's this cycle of of exploitation, in which uh, the transnational companies are the exploiters and the local communities are the exploited. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about the kind of transmutation of imperial colonialism into now this kind of globalized capitalism, um, with its far-reaching tentacles around the world, extracting resources and taking it back to its like, well, play people at the top. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and so this kind of deeply structural violence, I think it becomes very complicated as, and complex when, it can't, when we start to think about our complicity within it as well. And maybe that's why it's difficult for people sometimes to stand up to it, because you are all part of the problem. Um, as part of the like, wider society, we're all, we're all complicit as we're part of contemporary society and kind of facilitating and maintaining it. Um, and I think this brings up things around guilt and shame, which perhaps plays into the same kind of uh, denial um, or feelings of apathy. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, but but I also feel that sort of the the uh, campaigns that make individual people responsible for environmental uh, destruction is not necessarily very helpful. I mean, of course, you know, there are individual responsibilities in in how we live and how we contribute or not uh, to that environmental destruction through our 
uh, own consumption patterns, for example. However, ultimately, it's it's our democratic power of of uh, electing leaders who are able to put in place the legislation mm. and the regulatory bodies, so that that we are not individually responsible. No, and there are very simple examples. Why can't particular types of plastics not be simply banned? And that that does happen, but it could be much more widespread it's going way too slow this kind of decision no mm. and there's a whole range of things about regulation of of transnational companies or of uh, of amazon no or, or how uh, big companies monopolies almost uh, make so very much money is not only an an effect of individual um, consumption patterns it surely must also be um, a responsibility of states to regulate. Yeah, and regulate the economy, would you say then, to regulate the growth economy? Of course, of course. And the decisions that it makes with regard to uh, fiscal policy, redistribution and, uh, um, and, um, and the economy and economic growth are essential in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I read that the term litterbug was coined by the plastics industry to displace blame when it was when it was being shone on them back in the 70s or whenever it was um, to put the put, put the blame on the consumer that it was a kind of consumer's fault and role to be doing the recycling and um, mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting. It's um, interesting and then how about if we're going to be activists um, what do you, would you say are effective methods for subverting these power dynamics and shifting perceptions? Um, so that is a very good question, of course, because we all this is where we all have a responsibility, but it's sometimes so difficult to pinpoint down what our responsibility is. Um, in, in this highly atomized society that we're living in. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that um, social mobilization is very important and very effective. And we've seen that throughout uh, history that simple social mobilization is, is, is essential. Um, and that's true for sort of the bigger political movements and it's true for the smaller um, uh, for the smaller or local causes and so on. So social mobilization is is very important and on on all, every scale really. So and and that is part of the democratic process. No, have your voice heard. So the other part of the democratic process is voting and being part of those political uh, debates. Make sure that your vote is never lost. Um, so those are those are the most um, uh, the most clear political strategies, but there are of course many uh, other strategies of, of of what what each of us does in their own profession, and that might be uh, raising awareness by um, making podcasts or videos, or it might be teaching others in a classroom, or it might be. Uh, making particular things or so I think that we all have a role to play in our own profession to be uh, sensitive of the politics around us and make sure that that is always part of the things that that, that reflection is always part of our professional practice mm. so that we're aware of our own everyday practice and how we do or do not contribute uh, to a respectful and inclusive society, um, but also how we call out others who do not, either via education or via social activism. Yeah, I mean, the social media activism has been amazing in the last few years. I mean, with the recent Black Lives Matter, also Me Too movement, um, it's been a, a, such a big tool. And I think with the politicization of the social media sphere, increasing politicization of it, more and more and more people using it as a tool to call out political systems and also to educate. Um, Absolutely, absolutely. I think that social media has has all kinds of uh, uh, it has positive and negative 
uh, elements, of course, and one of the negatives is that we're all, you know, you, you tend to be in your own bubble and, and talking to your own, uh, uh, to your own group, and you don't necessarily see all the different opinions of others. But at the same time, um, it has a huge power of mobilization, of course, and of reaching out, and which is tremendous, and that is definitely a positive. And with all things that are new, and social media is still relatively new, these things will play out, you would hope, and uh, and settle into something that is manageable and um, um, and useful. Mm. It's also interesting, I think, because of the way it blurs um, personal and political or like the private and the public, which is like quite a, the feminist strategy, or I think of it as that feminist strategy of like Absolutely. consciousness raising. Um, and, I, and it does continue that in a subtly, I think. Um, I, I think that's a very good point that you're making there. And I think that sort of the idea of the personal is political or uh, simply sort of being aware of the fact that our everyday lives, um, that we can make changes in our everyday lives um, for the better, and that all the things that we do are to a certain extent political. And then I'm not saying that we are, we as individuals are responsible for, um, um, are solely responsible for changing society, but at the same time, the way we live our lives and what we do or do not um how we help shape norms and values is really important no mm. because just as as we have learned indeed as you suggest from uh, from feminist scholarship is that our everyday performance of who we are and how we um engage with others sets sort of the rules and reproduces the rules of gender roles, for example, of what we can be as men and as women and as queer. Um, so that also means that, uh, that we can, that if we realize that, then we can also use our everyday practice to unsettle those norms mm. and to question those norms for ourselves and for everybody around us. And that is important because unsettling and reflecting and questioning is what pushes us forward is what creates progressive politics mm. so discussion and debate and a pushing of boundaries and also i think um artistic like uh, art is an amazing tool for change creating of change um absolutely vehicle. i think that arts in general uh, all forms of arts are a form of communication in the end and a, not only form of communication but also a, 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 a space for reflection, no? So it's reflection, it's debate, it's um, uh, it's pushing ourselves to, um, um, to to imagine differently, to imagine a better and a, a better world, really. Mm. Are there any examples um, that you can think of of this mix of um, art and activism to create change around kind of gendered violence and destructive systems? I think that there's there's so much going on in uh, in a whole range of different spaces um, related to to art and, and gender violence and exploitation. So there's a, there's a lot of individual art artists, of course, who do uh, amazing work raising awareness or or using their art to discuss. Um, uh, to discuss certain issues that are close to their hearts. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly thinking about Sanela Muhoi, for example, who's a, who's a South African artist who's, who has, um, whose exhibition, I think, starts now in the Tate Modern or in, in the autumn, one of these months. Unfortunately, during these pandemic times, but for example, she uses photography to question ideas of masculinity and femininity in relation to um, to post-apartheid South Africa, so in relation to blackness. And that is really interesting and simply looking at her photography makes you question and think. So you know, that in a, in, a, in a museum such as State Modern means that, you know, uh, many millions of people will see that and will have that same experience of questioning. So those interventions are really important. But the, similarly, they're very, and this is, you know, this is Tate Modern and these are um, uh, 
big artists, but similarly, there are small activist groups in on the streets of South Africa or on the streets of Lima um, who use arts and performance in, in order to raise awareness about a particular issue, about gender violence, about uh, reproductive health, about uh, abortion, about a whole range of issues, you know, so using performance, using uh, poetry, using spoken word and so on in order to, um, uh, to raise awareness, to attract attention simply, you no, know, to say, hey, here we are. Sometimes a, a loud performance attracts more attention than simply a silent um, uh, protest in front of a courthouse, for example. So those, I think, are, are um, uh, uh, trusted strategies, really, uh, among a lot of activist artists and artist activists. Mm, to bring to the public sphere and then instigate yeah. this debate and discussion and reflection. And, and then what about the role of memory? Because I know that you also run a gender justice memory project. And I'm curious to know this role of memory, both in relation to gender, but also in relation to envi the environment as well. Yeah. So I think that memory is is a typical, you know, is a, is a memory is really a tool for um, for groups, but very often for for nations, uh, for people to use to create a certain narrative of the past. No, so you you, you establish a memory museum or you est establish particular memorials in order to. Uh, project a certain narrative of who you are as a people or what the past was. You know? Now, considering that, that particularly in post-conflict uh, societies that will then uh, project the narrative of the victors, those who have won the conflict or those who, who are in power. You know? Now, one of the things that we've done with the Gender Justice Memory Project is to look where are the women in this. No? So if we look at memorials and memory museums in post-conflict societies, where are the women? And then you see that uh, when, if you find them, if you find them, then they're very often portrayed as very uh, it, within the known stereotypes. You no, know? the woman as victim, uh, the woman as uh, survivor, and the woman as caretaker. The nurse, for example, no, or the nursing mother, of course. Um, so she's I, either rescued by heroic men or she is rescuing the children herself. You no, know? but there's no there's th th it's a very simplified narrative that reproduces uh, gendered stereotypes that in the end uh, are very harmful because they limit people's uh, possibility gender possibilities um, uh, in life. And they create this narrative of protection. You no know, men protect women, and that in the end uh, creates more violence rather than safety and security, um, because it suggests that women are weak and men are strong, and 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 creates that same binary. Um, so then we looked a little bit harder into sort of who, who within post-conflict societies we've looked at. South Africa at, at a whole range of uh, southern um, uh, of course uh, southern African countries including Zimbabwe, Uganda, Namibia um, and at several Latin American countries uh, uh, and Iraqi Kurdistan as well in order to look more what what are artists doing what other what counter narratives exist and then if you look a little bit more closer and you you start asking around then there are all kinds of feminist artists, activists, who pr provide a different narrative, what we then call counter narratives, but they're not very often included within those formal national narratives of post-conflict uh, history or memory making, no? So they might not have their, their artwork uh, exhibited in a national memory museum, but they might be at the fringes. No, or they might be part of protest movements. But there's an argument to be made to sort of to work with artists and curators and even museums in order to start including those counter narratives, those feminist counter narratives. And very often those feminist counter narratives are not limited to simply looking at where are the women in conflict, but take a much more holistic perspective. You know, and look at, okay, so what actually, what are the, the, the violent structures that, um, uh, that, have, that allow certain political violences to flourish? 
And if we can undermine those violent structures and we can question that and we can debate that, then maybe actually we might contribute to a more peaceful society in the future. Yeah. I mean, it is so, it's such an irony that um, history is told through the lens of warfare and political decision, whereas true global history is an is a outcome of the population and the people living an everyday life. Um, okay. And so, and the relationships and the effects that that has on the societies and the cultures that they develop. Um, so I, I love that idea about kind of rewriting history and retelling stories and using memory and art as a, as, as a way to do that um, and kind of recreate and retell. Um, exactly. The idea is so so you, if you can if you can retell and if you can every time include different perspectives upon history and upon memory and upon everyday life, then you start to create a new narrative that is more plural. So it can't be, you, you know, it's not about replacing one set of memories or one narrative for another narrative. It's very much about making those narratives more plural, more open to debate. And that then hopefully creates a society that is also capable in absor of absorbing different perspectives in a more peaceful manner. You know? mm. So it's about be, being able to create or to contribute to society that, that is capable of seeing, okay, I don't agree with you, but you no, know, that, that actually that allows for uh, uh, plurality and disagreement without polarization necessarily. And that is in the end what we, what we need if we, if, if we really want to transform society in, into becoming more peaceful, then, then that is what, what we need, no? Yeah, I, I really love how you foreground and highlight the plurality and diversity, because I think sometimes the core concept of feminism, people, people shun feminism because it's, they see it as just more kind of power over power over things like you replace masculine masculinism with feminism. Um, and and it doesn't really transform those same structures but when it's like this very intersectional plurality diversity multiplicity of stories and people and approaches then the central the power centrality is di is dissolved and, and 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 put across a much broader spectrum um and then if we'd like to go towards more transformative and um towards like transformation like what do you see as the steps that are needed for healing? Um, um, th that's a, a really difficult question because you know healing is something that takes generations and and it depends on on uh, what we are healing and that depends on on any specific context. So I don't I don't think that healing is necessarily um, the the right concept maybe freedom or, or, or freedom from yeah maybe maybe free so i i i think that um um you know freedom is uh, we need to fight for our freedom everyone you no know, on an everyday basis so again it's about this sort of um um interaction between the everyday and and our, the everyday lives that we live and sort of the bigger politics of which we are part and i think we should all be aware of that dynamic between the two you no know, between the small the everyday and and the bigger uh politics and be aware of the struggles in um uh, that many people are um are having to gain um, uh, a, a tiny little bit more freedom, no? So we also, and that means that we need to be aware of our own privilege. And again, that that is a, I use the, the term privilege in its actual sense, no? And not directed at one particular population group. Mm. I think we all need to be aware of our privileges in order to be able to recognize um, uh, what kind of privileges others might not have what kind of privileges we might uh, be able to share with others, how we can use our own privilege for the good of uh, the whole, for example. And so then if the value systems of domination, patriarchy are growth and um, control and power, what are the feminist, intersectional feminist values, values apart from diversity and plurality, what are the other um, values that would 
would kind of be the center. So uh, plurality and diversity, definitely. Um, I think uh, reflection is uh, really important. So a constant reflection on our actions and our politics. Um, so uh, politics is important as well. I think that um, uh, feminism, in, in the end, is a is a is a it's a political perspective because it it aims for for change, no, for for change in social relations that are embedded in our political system. Um, so uh, reflection uh, and respect for others, and again, that goes back to plurality. But I do think that that's really really important is being able to learn to listen um, because uh, by learning and li or listening and learning is is the only way forward no how we how we can uh, develop our ideas and um, uh, uh, and imagine something better mm. and that would immediately impact on our approach to the environment for sure because if you're valuing diversity you value the land uh, absolutely, valuing diversity, but also valuing you no know, and and listen to those who know. You no, know? I I look at the environment from a social political perspective and less so from an uh, um, from an environmentalist perspective or from a scientist's perspective. But that means that I need to have respect for those who know uh, the science of it and listen to that and respect that and not deny it. So it's also having respect for what other people know and learn from that you know because none of us know everything um so we need that means that we need to rely on the knowledge of others and, um, and which is a, a great privilege that we can do that of course which is fantastic mm. Mm. yeah thank you so much um Jalka. we've spoken now for almost an hour so we should wrap up but um it's been really amazing to, to talk to you um, and to see the environmental crisis through this lens of intersectional feminism. Um, because as, as I mentioned when we started, I, I really see it as such a transformative approach to understanding not just the problems, but also the solutions and the clear way that we can really move away from this extractive um, and destructive and exploitative um, systems that we are currently um, living among. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. It's, uh, it was really very nice to, to sing, think through some of these big issues and big problems. These are not easy things and there's not a straightforward answer, but it's important to keep on talking and discussing, I guess. Mm. Yeah, thank you.